<clears throat> We're going to begin with a, a study that we've done several times. It has, it has some arguments in it that are used in various presentations. So through the years, we've used it from time to time to make different points. So I do not intend to spend very much time on this other than to review it, put it in place, draw a thought out of it, set that thought aside, develop a couple more points, set those points aside in order to prepare the way for the end of the day. Um, at the end of the day, now I, I, I could be wrong, but at the end of the day is, the study at the end of the day is a really good study, <laughs> all right? But, but um, anyway, this is called the pattern of Christ. All right, and I'm just going to refer to it. I have the notes, uh, yeah, if you're on page 95, that will justify the premises that I'm, that I'm making. And what I'm saying is that this is a pattern of the history of Christ that was repeated in Revelation 11, which is the history of the Word of God, which is a type of Christ, which is repeated by the Antichrist, the papacy. Okay? And, and this is not the only place that you can illustrate this pattern in God's word, but upon the testimony of two or three, a thing is established, and we can use these three lines to establish the points that we want to use as we proceed through the rest of the day. And, you know, if I spelled anything wrong on this board, you just correct it on your notes, okay? I'm not going to worry about that. In, in this history here, what we're saying about this history, we're not talking about the pattern of the... Of the, the nature of Christ, we're talking about the prophetic waymarks in the time of Christ and calling that the pattern of Christ. And we're saying that Christ, from his birth until he was empowered at his baptism, was 30 years. You have a, you have a, a quote in there under preparation. And that once he was empowered at his baptism, he confirmed the covenant with many for how long? One week. Um, and this week goes over here to this time period, um, 34 A.D., at the stoning of Stephen. Okay, that's the week from here to here. I've seen a sister getting a, a mini Bible study outside the doors. We came in on the 2520. Maybe it's still happening. I don't see her in here. But um, please take note that the week that Christ confirms the covenant is... 2,520 days. And if you're at the point in your understanding of the Bible, uh, then you'll know that there is no accidents in God's Word, and that must mean something. And simply because Adventism doesn't quite understand what it means doesn't mean that it doesn't mean something, because there's no accidents in God's Word. All right. In the midst of the week, here, now this isn't, anyway, in the midst of the week, Christ is crucified, so how long did he give his testimony for? Three and a half years, 1260 days, however you want to express it. 30 years preparation, he's empowered at his baptism, he gives his testimony for three and a half years, then he dies, and, and of course this is way out of sync in terms of actual time. But then he's resurrected, then he ascends. Um, we have 34 AD, the stoning of Stephen, Stephen marked here. Then in this history we have the seven last plagues, and the reason I have that here is because we know that in AD 70, um, from 66 to 70, with the destruction of Jerusalem. That history, Sister White, s lines up with the time period of the seven last plagues. And then in your notes, you'll see a quote that you may or may not be familiar with, where Sister White says, in the days of the early Christians, Christ came a second time. He came his first time at his birth in Bethlehem, and he came a second time at the Isle of Patmos when he brought the revelation to John. So we're saying in the pattern of Christ, he has illustrated a line of prophecy that goes all the way to the end of the world, a prophetic line. Now, um, in this history, in this week, what's he, what's he doing according to Daniel 9? He's confirming the covenant. And what, in, in this covenant, there's two primary things that the covenant's based upon and that the covenant is established by. What's the covenant based upon? Perhaps. But what's the covenant based upon? God's Word. 
Okay, God has given his word. And what is the covenant uh, ratified with? His blood. Okay, so this, here he's confer- confirming the covenant and he's ratifying it with his blood, right? This is God's covenant, being ratified with his blood. But if you go to Revelation 11 now, that's what this is. This is Revelation 11, and this is in your notes. Revelation 11 is the history of the French Revolution, we understand, but it's the story of the Old and New Testament, the two candlesticks, the two prophets, the Bible, okay? And it's, it's governed by this ident- identical history, and we, we see that the Lord here is confirming the, the word of his covenant. Because how does he confirm his word? A testimony of two. It's in this line that it is being confirmed. This is the second testimony. Here's the first line. Now he's confirming this covenant. He's going to confirm the covenant with many for one week, and he's given us a second testimony. It just happens that this second testimony has to do with the word of God in the French Revolution, and the word of God is a type of Christ, and it's, that history is governed by the pattern of Christ. In verses 3 to 6, we see that the Old and New Testament are empowered. Okay, it uses the same words. It's in your notes. I'm not going to your notes. I'm put them in, I put it in your notes, so you can test me later on. Once they're empowered, the Old and New Testament... In verses 3 to 6, how long did they give their testimony for? 1260. 1260. And then what happens? What's the beast from the bottomless pit do? He sends and he kills them. Is that not what it says? And where did they die? It says where Christ died, right? In Sodom and Egypt. Did Christ die in Sodom and Egypt? So it's making sure that we understand that this history... Is, be, is paralleling this history, but this history is prophetic in nature. We know that Christ didn't die in Sodom and Egypt. Christ died at Golgotha. But it's this identical history. After their death, um, they're resurrected, are they not? Verse 11. And in verse 12, what does it say? They ascend to heaven. right? Um, verse 13 talks about the earthquake. Let's go there. Let's read verse 13. This is one of the points that we want to grab out of this as we proceed. You can go to Revelation 11:13 in your Bible, or you can pull it out of your notes as we move through. Um, and I'm uh, on page 98, top of the page. And the same hour, and that's what I'd like you to underline there, The same hour there was a great earthquake, and a tenth part of the city fell, and in the earthquake were slain of men seven thousand, and the remnant were affrighted and gave glory to the God of heaven. This earthquake is the French Revolution. One tenth of the city fell. The tenth of the city, a city in Bible prophecy is a kingdom, and the kingdom in Bible prophecy that's divided into ten parts was the Roman Empire, and one tenth of the Roman Empire was France, and France fell during the French Revolution, and the French Revolution is represented by this earthquake, and Sister White tells us that the French Revolution is an illustration of the same thing as the destruction of Jerusalem. It's right in line. It's the the chaos and anarchy that takes place. At this point in the end of the world, verse 14 says, The second woe is past. Behold, the third woe cometh quickly. Down here, the pioneers understand, understood that the third woe was the, the crisis that leads all the way to the second coming of Christ, and even, even all the way to the end of the millennium. But nevertheless, the third woe in verse 14 is a representation of the second coming of Christ. So this is, this is old material. I'm going quickly. You have all the verses in it. So what I'm saying to you, that, to those of you that may not have seen this before, is that in the pattern of Christ, he was born and he was 30 years in preparation. He was empowered at his baptism. He gave his testimony for three and a half years. Then he was crucified. Then he was resurrected. Then he was ascended. Then with the destruction of Jerusalem, we see the time period of the seven last plagues that leads to him visiting John at Patmos, which is a type of the second coming of Christ. Here he's ratifying the covenant with his blood. Here he's given a second testimony to these sequences of events, but he's dealing now not with himself as he walks through earth, but with the Old and New Testament, which is the word of God, which is a type of Christ. And the 
illustration in the French Revolution is a, a, a perfect parallel. They're empowered. They give their testimony for 1260 days. Then they die. Then they're resurrected. Then they ascend. Then we have the French Revolution, seven last plague time period. And then the third woe, second coming of Christ. As a third testimony to this, we have the pattern of Antichrist. Antichrist, one that is in place of Christ, one that personates Christ. And it's not an accident that from 508 to 538, how much preparation time was there for the papacy to be empowered? 30 years just like Christ. And then the papacy is empowered in 538, and it gives its satanic testimony for how long? 1260 years. And then what happens? Papacy receives a deadly wound right on time. The deadly wound uh, lining up with the death of the Old and New Testament in the middle of the French Revolution, lining up with the cross. But we know the Bible prophecy says that the papacy is going to be what? The deadly wound was healed. It's going to be resurrected. And when it's resurrected, then it's going to ascend to the throne of the earth. And then will come the genuine seven last plagues and the second coming of Christ. Okay, you with me? Okay. Let me? Let me try to add a couple thoughts to this. We'll try to pull something out of this and move forward. This here, this here, this history here. I wanted another board so I didn't have to get this too cluttered. We don't have another board, all right? No, I can't flip it over. I'll be flipping back and forth the whole time. So let me, let, me, let me keep it simple. I don't know if you'll be able to see this out here, but there's something I want you to see about this. This is 457, the beginning of the 2300 days, all right? And one initial prophecy of this is 490 years that are what? Determined for God's people. They're cut off. This is the 490 year probationary time for ancient Israel that ends down here with the, when what? Stephen. When Stephen Snow, what, what else? When Michael stands up, okay? This is uh, 34 AD. And what, what is this 490 years? I started the very first day. It's a probationary time. Peter says to Christ, should we forgive a person seven times? And Jesus says you should forgive him 70 times seven times. That's 490 times. And this 490 years is cut off from the 2300 years as a probation for the Jews. 490 in the scriptures represents a probationary time. And in this probationary time, we have here at the end this sacred week. Okay, from here to here. He confirms the covenant with many for 2520 days. Right? Okay? So I want you to see here, in this, in the story of the French Revolution, that it also, um, that now, I'm not talking about this line, I'm talking about the French Revolution. It says, And I will give power unto my two witnesses, and they shall prophesy, clothed in sackcloth, for 1260 years. Right? Well, that's talking about being empowered in 538. But we know that when you get the, the microscope, on Revelation 11, it's talking about the French Revolutionary time period. It's talking about the two witnesses being empowered to give their witness while they're clothed in sackcloth during the 1260 years. But it's also talking about a week down here at the end of the 1260 years, the week of the French Revolution, right? You following me? Which is 1789 to 1797, and of course, in 1798, the deadly wound is healed. And we know that in Revelation 2, verse 21, I believe, maybe 20, 20, 21, that the papacy was given space to repent. All right? This 1260 years is also a probationary time, right? Given more than one speaker here um, has dealt with this. So I want you to see that in this time prophecy, which is a probationary time, and in this time period, which is a probationary time, that you have within it, within that probationary time, you have a 2,520 day time period, seven years, where the covenant is confirmed. Here in this, in this history, 
the covenant is ratified with the blood of Christ, and here God's word, which the covenant is based upon, is confirmed. You have to have them both. Okay, if God hadn't given his word, there'd be nothing to use the blood to ratify. His word is the covenant and had to be ratified by the blood, right? Everyone with me? But I want you to see that these two, these two periods that are part of these probationary times, these two seven-year periods are included inside a longer prophecy, which is defined as probationary time. Are you with me? Yes. Okay. Yeah. This may seem hard, but if you, if you don't strain your brain on it and you just keep it at a basic level, um, it, it'll be helpful when we get to the end. Okay. This, just this basic understanding will impact some of the conclusions that we have to draw. Go to Revelation 11 um, so we can make, we're going to go one step further in all of this. I like to be able to read those that I'm interacting with, and it's really difficult at the end of a long week like this. But I'm hoping that you got those points. If I'm thinking that you don't have those points, I'm almost tempted to go back and go through them one more time. But go to Revelation 11:13. OK? It says, "In the same hour." Was there a great earthquake? And brothers and sisters, the standard Adventist understanding, and it's correct, is this earthquake represents the French Revolution. Okay, but it also represents this history right here. Okay, from here to here. This this is the, the, the seven years of the French Revolution when the Word of God is confirming the covenant. That's the French Revolution time period. And verse 13 is saying it is an hour. Do you read that? Is that how you, in, this, in the same hour is this great earthquake. So this great earthquake is an hour. Okay, you with me? Yeah. All right. Because why is that important? Well, one of the reasons it might be important is that the United Nations is going to agree to give its political structure to the Pope of Rome for one hour, okay? And so we want to make sure we understand what this one hour is and what's going on in this one hour. And one of the things that's going on in this one hour is that there is a covenant being confirmed in this one hour. And when the covenant's being confirmed, we know what the way marks are, don't we? Because we got the testimony of two. Christ is here confirming the covenant. The covenant being confirmed begins when Christ is baptized, right? And a mighty angel comes down out of heaven, empowering Christ to give his testimony for 1260 years. And in this history of the French Revolution, the Word of God, although we don't specifically see a divine symbol coming down, we know by other prophecies that this is inferred there. The beginning of this history we're told the Old and New Testament are empowered, and then they walk through the very same way marks. Okay? So what I'm saying is, this one hour, when the covenant is confirmed for one week, we know what the way marks are. There's a testimony, then death, resurrection, ascension, and then Michael stands up. Okay? That's, that's a good one to see. So if you go to your, your notes, let's look a little further at the one hour. It, we, have, uh, we can't look at the hour I left a little part out, but if you go to page 100 before we get to the one hour, I'm not going to deal with these, but I want you to see something. In this history here, the history of Christ, there is a change of dispensation taking place. From the Old Testament to the New Testament. From the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. <laughs> However you want to express it. From the old to the new. There's a change of dispensation from the earthly sanctuary to the heavenly sanctuary. And, and it's specifically addressed in the Word of God, this change of dispensation. And this is important to understand because when Antichrist parallels this history, there's a change of satanic dispensation going on from paganism to papalism. 
All right, and we've, we've put this study in the record over and over again. So on page 100, I'm just going to show you, point to a few of these, and, uh, and it, they've been being done particularly uh, by Pastor Howard. Uh, it, but everyone seems to be having, been mentioning these things today, that, that you know, when the mystery of iniquity is reaching its climax, the mystery of godliness is reaching its climax. When the image of the beast is being developed, the image of Christ is being developed. These, these two lines, I remember Brother Dewey having two lines across here. One was solid, one was broken, and it was the story. What was the story? The, the, the true king of the north and the false king of the north? How were you expressing it? Don't define it. Just what are the labels? <laughs> okay, okay, that I was right. All right. So there's these two contrasts. All right. So let I'll point you to some of them on page 100 where it says Jerusalem and Babylon. Hebrews 10, 8 through 10 says, and when he said, sacrifice and oblation and burnt offerings and offerings for sin, thou wouldest not, neither hadst pleasure therein, which are offered by the law. Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O God. He taketh away the first to establish that he might establish the second. And when Christ is taking away the earthly sanctuary to establish the heavenly sanctuary, this is going on with the, the story of the Antichrist. Paganism is being taken away in 508 in order to establish, establish papalism. Of course, of course, you'd never get that if you throw out the pioneer understanding of the daily. All right. But so we'll just I'll point you to some of these um, on the bottom of the page um, 100. Christ testifies by a means of death right here. The Pope, the papacy testifies by means of death, a deadly wound in 1798. OK, this is their testimony, their testimony. Um, the Bible tells us to worship the son is to worship the father. Um, but the Bible tells us to worship the papacy is to worship the dragon. Okay, the dragon is paganism, it's the father. Uh, the papacy is the son of the dragon. So you will see several of these references. The father gives all to the son, Matthew eleven twenty seven, 27, and the dragon gives the papacy its power, seat, and great authority, gives all to the papacy. So in these lines, one of the things that you see is a change of dispensations that, that is very clearly marked out. Okay? And once you do that, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of light that can be generated from that understanding. Because these two, gen, these two change of dispensations are pointing forward to the next change of dispensation, which Sister White says we're now living in the dispensation, this is her words, the dispensation of the Holy Spirit. And when Christ left, he says it's expedient that I go, why? that I can send the Holy Spirit, okay? This is the introduction of the, the third of three dispensations of sacred history. And what's the third of three satanic dispensations? The false prophet. Paganism is the dragon. The papacy is the beast. And it was expedient that the papacy received a deadly wound that the false prophet, apostate Protestant, might arrive. And in 1798, when the papacy receives the deadly wound, then you have the story of Carmel, the story of Elijah, and the story of Jeroboam and the disobedient prophet. They are coming to Carmel, and the Lord's going to demonstrate who the true prophet is, and he demonstrates that Millerite Adventism is the true prophet, and in 1842 he demonstrates that Protestantism has begun its role as the false prophet of Bible prophecy. You're now in the third satanic dispensation, the dispensation of the false prophet, but all it is is paralleling the third holy dispensation where Jesus said, it's expedient that I go, that I might send you the Holy Spirit. Okay, so there's a lot of, lot of information to be generated from this particular study. It's all in the record. We're not doing this particular study. We're just putting some points in place for this particular study. All right. I didn't quite hear that, but the answer is no. You may not realize it, but we're moving very quickly. Um, Go to, go to page 105. 
just, just so you make sure that you, you understand everything as I'm understanding it, you will see historical references that the French Revolution was seven years, okay? Um, on the top of page 100, you have a reference from Uriah Smith that says the French Revolution began in 1789. And the reason I'm saying this is sometimes when I deal with the French Revolution, people will, will give different dates for it and they seem to be unfamiliar with it. All right, the next quote on there says 1793. Once again, you have Uriah Smith marking the reign of terror uh, that begins in 1793 in the midst of the week. The Word of God, the Old and New Testament, are crucified. All right? And then you, on the bottom you have from Josiah Litch marking the end in 1797. And, there, and there, we have some Frenchmen in the, the audience that should be experts on this, and they will confirm also that the French Revolution was seven years, and in the midst of those seven years is when the blood was shed. Is that wee oui, wee? Oui? Okay, all right. So, we want to see that because verse 13 of Revelation 11 says that the French Revolution was one hour. All right, that's, that's the reason we're taking a little bit of time here. Now, I'm, I'm on page 105, and we can read this from the Bible in Revelation 17. It's, this is one of the things we need to put in place. Verse 12 of Revelation 17 says this, And the ten horns which thou sawest are ten kings, which have received no kingdom as yet. Whoever they are, it's one kingdom. Amen. This is just ten kings that receive no kingdom. Singular. It doesn't say no kingdoms. This is the United Nations, brothers and sisters. The power at the end of the world that gives its support to the papacy is a civil power that is worldwide in nature. And if you don't recognize that we're at the end of the world, then you're not going to get anything that's being said this week. Okay? The first, one of the first premises is you have to understand that everything is reaching its conclusion. And if you understand just that simple truth, then when you realize there's a worldwide political system that's given to the papacy at the end, your only choice is the United Nations, there is not enough time before Jesus returns for somebody to build up a secondary worldwide organization to usurp the development of the United Nations. And it's time that Seventh-day Adventists got their nose in the Bible and realized that the United Nations is the dragon power at the end of the world it is easy to demonstrate if you would but open the Word of God. Okay, it's just because our pioneers didn't teach that, I don't know how they could teach it. The United Nations didn't arrive in history until 1946. How could we expect pioneer testimony to the United Nations when it was still 100 years away? But it's easy to show that these 10 kings are the United Nations. Verse 12. And the 10 horns which thou sawest are 10 kings which have received no kingdom as yet, receive power as king. How long? One hour, one hour with the beast. And of course... What I'm suggesting is that this one hour is the one hour of Bible prophecy and one of the illustrations, one of many illustrations of the one hour of Bible prophecy is the one hour of the French Revolution. Okay, Follow me, we've got Revelation 11.13 says the French Revolution was one hour. Okay, and Who wrote Revelation 11 verse 13? Who wrote Revelation 17.12? So, you know, there's good reason to think that he was talking about the same thing, all right? Amen. He's the same prophet in the same book of the Bible, and all the prophets agree with one another, even if it wasn't John. But receive power as kings one hour with the beast. These have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. These shall make war with the lamb, and the lamb shall overcome them, for he is Lord of lords and king of kings, and they that are with him are called and chosen and faithful. These are those, the ten kings, the United Nations. This is the group that's going to spill the blood. Okay. Papacy is going to stand back in Samaria, and Ahab's going to go out and spill the blood. Okay. That's what it says. They're going to make war with the Lamb. So it's interesting that if you take your concordance, it's more than interesting, it's mind-blowing if you haven't ever done it, and you take the word our, you'll find that the references for our in the, the Bible 
are dealing with the Sunday law testing time, which is this one hour that the United Nations rules the world. Okay, that's what it is, but what's even more interesting, there's, if you get your concordance out, and Sister White has a quote where she says, all those that are given the third angel's message are, are studying with the same plan adopted by Father Miller, you know that quote? In fact, if you read it carefully, it means you can't give the third angel's message if you're not using William Miller's rules of prophetic interpretation. And how did William Miller study the Bible? Concordance. With the concordance, okay. So get your concordance out and run the word hour, and you're going to see several references for the word hour in the New Testament. But you know something? You only find the word hour in one book in the Old Testament. Book of Daniel. So we'll start there to try to figure out what this hour represents. Now, doesn't that mean something? <laughs> doesn't that mean how many books are in the Old Testament and there's only one of them that uses the word hour? It happens to be the book that awakens and prepares and provides the message for God's people at the end of the world. Daniel 3, 6 and 15 says, And whoso falleth not down in worship, shall that the same hour be cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. Ah, the hour is when God's people are cast into the midst of the fiery furnace. There is at least 11 different places, perhaps more, at least 11 different places where Sister White says that this test of the furnace and the image in Daniel chapter 3 is the Sunday law. Okay, This hour, the same hour, now, if you be ready that at what time you hear the sound of the cornet, flute, harp, sackbut, psaltery, dulcimer, and all kinds of music, ye fall down and worship the image which I've made, well, but if you worship not, you shall be cast the same hour into the midst of the fiery furnace. So there's a testimony from Daniel that the hour represents the Sunday law crisis. Next page in your notes from Daniel 4.19, different chapter, different story. Then Daniel, whose name was Belteshazzar, was astonished for one hour. Why was Daniel astonished, or astonished, or however you pronounce that? Why was he? Because he just heard the 2520 judgment that's going to be accomplished against who? Now, he just heard the story of the judgment of Babylon. And when does Babylon get judged? in the same hour in the Sunday Law Crisis. In fact, what is the message during the Sunday Law Crisis? Babylon is fallen. She's being judged. In fact, when the angel comes to John in Revelation 17, where we see the one hour that the ten kings agree to give their kingdom to the beast for one hour, when the angel comes at the beginning of Revelation 17, what's he say he's going to explain to him? That Judgment of Babylon. So in this hour, you're seeing that judgment of the Babylon, and you're seeing the Sunday law crisis when God's people are cast into the fiery furnace by these ten kings who make war against the Lamb, right? In Daniel, um, I'll just read on. 4.33, it says, The same hour was this thing fulfilled upon Nebuchadnezzar, and he was driven from men. And then in 5.5, 5, it says, and this isn't Nebuchadnezzar now, this is Belshazzar, In the same hour came forth fingers of a man and wrote over against the candlestick upon the wall. And you just read everywhere in the Old Testament where the word hour is found. And it all has to do with the Sunday law crisis during the time period when Babylon's falling. Now, the two witnesses are the Old and New Testament, so we're going to pick up a couple from the New Testament as, as well. Um, I've already referenced Revelation 17, 1. The angel came to show um, John the judgment of Babylon. Notice Matthew 10, 16 through 23. Behold, I send you forth as sheep in the midst of wolves. Be ye therefore wise as serpents and harmless as doves. But beware of men. For they will de deliver you up to councils, and they will scourge you in their synagogues, and you shall be brought before governors and kings for my sake, for a testimony against them and the Gentiles. But when they deliver you up, take no thought how or what you shall speak, for it shall be given to you in that same hour. Okay, this is the Sunday law testing time. You're going to get arrested, you're going to get pulled in in front of a judge, but in that hour... 
the Lord is going to speak through you. In fact, you know he is because in that hour you have the seal of God. You've already demonstrated that you are a tool in the hand of Christ. And he's going to say what he wants to say in that hour. That's the promise. But that's the hour of Bible prophecy. Are all the prophets speaking about the end of the world? Yeah. Ah, okay, it's all about the end of the world. That hour is the Sunday law crisis. Um, we've already read verse 14. Next page. Um, Matthew 20, verses 6 through 9. What else goes on during the Sunday law crisis? And about the eleventh hour he went out and found some others standing idle and said unto them, Why stand ye here all the day idle? They say unto him, Because no man hath hired us. He saith unto them, Go you also into the vineyard, and whatsoever is right shall you receive. So when even was come, the Lord of that vineyard said unto his servants, Call the laborers and give them their hire, beginning from the last unto the first. And when they came that when they came that were hired about the eleventh hour, they received any man, every man a penny. When did the eleventh hour workers get involved in the work? <laughs> Sunday law crisis. Where does the Sunday law crisis begin? The United States. Okay. I'm saying that this is the hour that's also been prefigured by the hour of the French Revolution. And just to give you a clue of what I'm saying about the waymark, so you can, so you can start putting some logic in place, it says of the French Revolution that the two witnesses were given power right here, that they might give their testimony for three and a half years, right? And this lines up when Christ was given power, correct? And when Christ was given power, we see a divine symbol coming down. What's the divine symbol? The dove. Of course, we have other reform lines that say when it's, there's an empowerment, a divine symbol comes down. So when the Sunday, if the, when the, if the Sunday law crisis is this hour of Revelation 17, then at the beginning of this hour, there should be an empowerment, right? And the, the Sunday law crisis begins where? The Sunday law crisis begins where? The United States. What happens then? Satan comes down out of heaven. Does he not? Personating Christ. Why? To empower that message right on time. Okay? It's a satanic counterfeit of... Wait till you see it, okay? Wait till you see it. All the prophecies that we understand apply to God's people are counterfeited. I don't know if the counterfeit's the right word. Satan works out his history through the papacy and the dragon and the false prophet being governed by the prophecies that have governed God's people through history point by point with the one qualifier that I hope I remember to mention a few day, times today, especially for the DVDs. After 1844, time is no longer. Okay, so we've been talking about setting time prophecy here at the end of the world. Don't read that into it. General Conference Bulletin, January 1st, 1900. Ah, uh, that's just a reference to the one-hour laborers, okay? They come in in the Sunday Law Crisis. Notice, and um, Pastor Howard was dealing with this very thing, and um, John 12, 23 through 28 says, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Okay, I'm saying, of course, his hour that he's glorified is here, but this hour is this history where he's confirming the covenant with many for one week. This is where he's glorified. He's glorified at the cross, but it's this sacred week, this 2,520 days. And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you... So when's this passage pointing forward to? Pardon me? Well, all, yeah, fourth angel, because verily, verily, and because all the prophets are speaking about the end of the world... And what Sister White say? It's the voice of Christ that speaks through patriarchs and prophets from the days of Adam till the closing scenes of time. So we can talk about all the prophets uh, being in agreement with one another and all speaking about the end of the world, but the reality of it is every word in the Bible is the voice of Christ. So he certainly knows the symbols and the rules that he built into the Bible. So when he says, verily, verily, he knows that he's saying it twice with a purpose. He says, understand this passage 
is for the latter rain time period because the symbol of this passage is Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Awake, awake. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abideth alone. But if it die, it bringeth forth much fruit. He that loveth his life shall lose it, and he that hateth his life in this world shall keep it unto life eternal. If any man serve me, let him follow me. And where I am, there shall also my servant be. If any man serve me, he will my father honor. Now is my soul troubled, and what shall I say? Father, save me from this hour. But for this cause I came unto this hour. Father, glorify thy name. Then came there a voice from heaven saying, I have both glorified it. And you notice that. He'd already glorified it, hadn't he? I want you to see something. This hour is the, the, the whole week. I'm not going to argue that it's the cross where he's lifted up. But he says, I've already glorified it. When did he say he glorified it first? At the baptism. This is my, my son, okay? The, he's glorified in this week when he's confirming the covenant. Okay? That's not a denial of the, the, the emphasis on the cross. But it's this sacred week where he confirms the covenant with many for one week. You with me on that? Okay. Um, I have both glorified it and I will glorify it again. He's going to glorify it at the cross in a second, but it's also saying that he's going to glorify it again at the end of the world because his people at the end of the world are going to what? Perfectly reflect his character. All right? Those who wait for the bridegroom's coming are to say to the people, Behold your God, the last rays of merciful light, the last message of mercy to be given to the world, is a revelation of his character of love. The children of God are to manifest his glory. In their own life and character, they are to reveal what the grace of God has done for them. When are they to manifest his glory? In the Sunday law crisis, in the hour that the ten kings agree to give their kingdom unto the papacy. All right, we made good time. It, maybe, I can get behind real quick. Let's turn right over to part 16. I didn't know where, how far we we're gonna get and I'm not threatened by just moving into part 16. So, seeing as we have just a little time. We've given three testimonies here about this sequence, all right? And we are seeing that in two of these sequences, we clearly have identified a, a week, all right? You may want to argue that it's not exactly what I'm putting on it. We know in this week he's confirming the covenant. And in this 2520, um, he's confirming his word. It's about the Old and New Testament, and his covenant is based upon his word. That's what part of the covenant story is God gave his word. But how does he ratify his word? With his blood. So you have to have these two. These seven weeks are a time period of a covenant. And these covenant weeks are both located in larger prophecies, if you will, in the 490 years and in the 1260 years. And both of those time periods, the 490 and the 1260, are defined prophetically as periods of probation. Okay? All right? So even if you don't know where I'm going with that, if you keep that in your memory blank, bank, we will um, try to develop that a little further. Um, I have found that from... I've, I've, I won't go there. It doesn't seem like as Seventh-day Adventists we really understand what a Seventh-day Adventist is when we start giving ourselves test questions. So I've found that when I ask Seventh-day Adventists about the 2300-year prophecy, it's amazing what we don't know, even at the simple level. How many prophecies are in the 2300-year prophecy? I have to stop and count, all right? <laughs> but if we were handling it on a regular basis, we would know, because, and we should be handling it on a regular basis, because Sister White says that Daniel 8.14 is the foundation of Adventism. This is, this is a prophecy. If there's any prophecy that we should understand, we should understand this one well. Okay? So for a long time, when I asked this question, I would say there's five. Okay? The first one is that the streets and walls are going to be built within 49 years. There's one time prophecy. From 457, 49 years later, the streets and walls are going to be built in troublous times, if you understand that, say amen. 
Then you have 490 years from 457 until Michael stands up at the stoning of Stephen, correct? There's another one. Then you have the one that, that marks when Jesus is baptized, becomes the Messiah officially. And then in the midst of the week, the sacred week, he's crucified. And then you have 1844 when Adventism comes into history. That's five. But really, if you look at it, it's six. Okay, because that sacred week is a prophecy unto itself. And these prophecies that bring you to the beginning of the sacred week when he's baptized, in the middle of the sacred week when he's crucified, and the end of the sacred week when Stephen is stoned, those are time prophecies of their own, but the, the week is actually a prophecy unto itself. So you, it, it would have been good if you said five, but probably six is better. We didn't say much of anything. And that's generally the way it is in Adventism. And I think we should understand these, these things. So I expected this. Um, so I wanted to make sure that we understood it. Because, Lord willing, we're going to show you that the papacy is governed by the 2300-year prophecy. And all five of these prophecies mark the final movements of the papacy. And if you don't understand what they are, as we understand it in the 2300 days. If you don't understand that the streets and walls were finished in 49 years, then you're going to have a hard time getting the point as we see, show the parallel line of that history. So you can see on the bottom of page 109 the, the prophecies that we're speaking of. There's six of them. I've mentioned them. They're in your memory bank. Um, and r really, if you were expecting some, a lot of conclusions out of this presentation. I never intended to be making conclusions. There's a lot of development. Then this afternoon, it should be very easy. Okay. Um, now, I want to I make a, 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 another little point here. When we get to 1844, on the top of page 110, when you get to 1844, what starts, Sister Becky? Never mind, don't want to put you on the spot. What starts in 1844? <laughs> Investigative judgment, that's the beginning. But when, the, when we get to the end of the judgment time, what do we enter into? Judgment of the living. You have it on your paper. I want to mark those, those differences. It begins by judging the dead. It ends during the judgment of the living. What ends? The judgment. Of course, in the judgment of the living, according to Acts 3.19, what's going on in the judgment of the living? The blotting out of sins and the Holy Spirit's being poured out because people have sent their sins beforehand to judgment. So when you're in the judgment of the living, in that time period, the Holy Spirit's being poured out from heaven, right? Okay, and now on the bottom of page 110, you have Matthew 18, where we've mentioned that Jesus said you forgive your brother seven times 70 times, 490, and you have Daniel 9:24 where 490 years are cut off um, for God's people, or for Israel, who was God's people, representing a probationary time. And I want to go back to where we started the first day, and I purposely started back there the first day, which seems so long ago. Doesn't it seem like so long ago? But doesn't it seem like it just flew by? <laughs> Isn't that weird how that always happens that way? We started... Um, one of the things we shared, and I did it just to put it in your memory bank one time, because I hoped that we would get to this point, that from Passover here, from Passover until Samuel, according to Paul, in Acts 13, which is in your notes, from Passover to Samuel, is how long? 490 years. Everyone see that in your notes? And what does Saul, Samuel do? He anoints the first king and the second king. But the, he, the Bible chronologists tell us from Saul, the first king, until Zedekiah, the last king, is 490 years. Right? But we've also noted, just to put these things into perspective, that the history of Moses and the deliverance out of Egypt is a link in the chain, is it not? And the link in the chain is a 3-1 combination. 
And the three one combination in the history of Moses was that Moses brought a reform message. That's the number one message. Pharaoh resisted that message because the second way mark in these histories is the activities of the enemies. And then the third way mark is where judgment is illustrated, and that was Passover. And the third way mark is always followed by a disappointment. Hebrews by the Red Sea with the Red Sea in front of them, Pharaoh's army behind them. And then 50 days later, they were at Pentecost. So this is a link in the chain, in that history. There's a change of dispensation taking place here from altars to the tent. When we get to the time period of Saul, Samuel anointing Saul, we see in the history of, of Samuel, we see a link too. Uh, Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas, and the disappointment represented by Ichabod, and then Samuel's raised up. And there's also, once again, a change in dispensation from the tent in Shiloh to Jerusalem. Now the Lord is choosing Jerusalem. The Lord is not just going to put a tent in Jerusalem. He's going to raise up the permanent sanctuary in Jerusalem. And no accident that it's the third king, Solomon, that builds the temple. Correct? But there's a disappointment. Immediately after Solomon, the kingdom is divided between north and south. And, of course, this is where the history of Rehoboam, Jeroboam, the disobedient prophet, the lion and the ass. And I, just for the record, just for the record, I thought I heard it said that the disobedient prophet, that he died on the way with the lion and the ass, and the way was the old path. The way is not the old path, where the disobedient prophet that represents the disobedient Adventism dies is the, the way that the Bible says, there is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the ends thereof are destruction. Okay, that's where he died. He died in the way of destruction. And the, the only reason he ended up there is because he didn't go home, right? <laughs> but what, what did he do before he went home? He sat down under the tree which allowed, allowed the sons of the false prophet to catch up to him. He sat down underneath the tree of knowledge. And in the 30s, of course, Adventism decided it had to get accreditation so that we could be like the Greeks. And the disobedient prophet was waylaid by the sons of the false prophet, which is probably Martin and Barnhouse, right? They come and say, hey, come back and eat some of apostate Protestantism's bread and water. But that's another story. <laughs> on the third king, the temple is built. And then on the third king, Zedekiah, Nebuchadnezzar, the fourth king in this 3-1 combination, he deals with all three of these kings. And on the third king, the temple is built. And on the third king, it's destroyed. Right? And the first, the first attack against Jehoiachin starts the 70 years, right? Correct? When's the 70 years in? 536. Okay. 70 years in is 536, and then what comes immediately thereafter? 519. No, 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 no. I'm talking about kings. We now have three kings. Who are the three kings? Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. And on the third king, Artaxerxes, what happens? The decree goes forth, but what else happens? They've, built, they've rebuilt the temple, right? Uh, this 2300-year prophecy begins, but notice, the third king builds a temple. Temple destroyed on the third king. Tem temple built on the third king. Only these are three decrees, but they're kings. Nehemiah secures the fourth decree. All these are links in the chain. But in this 2300-year prophecy, the, the first big prophecy, let's put it that way, is the one we've been dealing with, the time period cut off for Israel, which was 490 years. Right? Now, do you think that that's an accident? That th 
34 AD, that we have 490 years, 490 years, and we're going to deal with the 70 years, and then 490 years. And we know that Jesus said he'd forgive a person seven times 70, and we know that the 490 years here was cut off as a probationary time for ancient Israel, and it lasted until Michael stands up at the stoning of Stephen. Is that right? Is that what happens? Michael stands up at the stoning of Stephen. Are you getting that in your memory bank? Because we want to be able to tie Michael standing up in with all of this. And this is 490 years when the Lord is guiding his people through what? Through judges and prophets, correct? But this is 490 years where he's leading his people by what? King. What's a king? A state. Ah, this is state. And if he's leading them through prophets, what, what is it? Church, okay. You, there was a step in between that we just passed over because we're all good students of prophecy. This was a, a, a theocracy. This was a monarchy. State, church, okay. Um, let's see where we're at. We have a couple minutes. Put something in the record. Right? Two minutes, 28 seconds. Go to Isaiah 23. Two minutes and 20 seconds. Jeremiah. Isaiah 23, I'm sorry. It's in your notes. But I'm, it's page 111 or... We're, there, we're going to have to deal with Isaiah 23 when we come back. I'm just going to show you something now. There's a lot to do. Uh, there's something in here for one brother I was talking about earlier this morning. There's something for him especially, but and it's for everyone. Uh, about Islam, okay, but we're not going to touch Islam in Isaiah 23, although Islam is smack dab in the middle of Isaiah 23. We want to deal with just one point and close and go eat physical food. Isaiah 23, verse 1 says, The burden of Tyre. Tyre, how ye ships of Tarshish, for it is laid waste, so that there is no house, no entering in from the land of Kittim. From the land of Kittim, it is revealed to them. And I say that, and Pastor Manny isn't here. He's the one that corrected me. I've been saying Chittim for 20 years, but it is Kittim. Whatever, whatever the, the Tyre and um, Tarshish is all about. It's revealed to us from the land of Kittim. We'll deal with that in the next presentation. Okay, but what I want? Let's start by identifying who Tyre is. First off, do all the prophets speak about the end of the world? Yeah. Um, do they all agree with one another? Yeah. So let's first identify Tyre and go to the last couple verses in Isaiah 23, verse 17. Verse 17 says this. Let's back up. Let's, not, let's start with 17. And it shall come to pass after the end of how many years? Seven. We have 70 years here. Ah, I wonder, I wonder if there's any accidents in the word of God. Okay, it shall come to pass at the end of 70 years that the Lord will visit Tyre and she, Tyre's a woman. Uh, okay, so Tyre's a church. And she shall turn her hire. What does, it, what does it mean when a woman turns to hire? What do they say in the... In the, the, the yeah, okay. And she'll commit fornication with all, not some of, with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. Not all the kingdoms in the Middle East. This is the woman at the end of the world that commits fornication with every king in the world. I wonder who Tyre is. This is the papacy, right? Easy one. Now go back up to verse 15 as we bring this to a close. And it shall come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years, according to the days of three kings. Uh, whatever it means that the papacy is forgotten, she's forgotten for 70 years, and the 70 years is here defined as the days of one king. What does that mean? I can tell you easy what that means. See up here? Israel was overthrown by Babylon and they went into captivity for 70 years and the 70 years ended when the Medes and the Persians threw over Babylon. So Israel was captive for 70 years which was the days of Babylon. One kingdom. One king. See it? 70 years the days of one king. 
So Tyre is going to be forgotten, whatever that means, for the time period of one of the kingdoms of Bible prophecy. I wonder when the papacy was forgotten. 1798, maybe? <laughs> Received a deadly wound. It went and hid in Samaria. What kingdom came into history in 1798? Ah, so the 70 years. It's not 70 years. It's the period that the United States is the sixth kingdom of Bible prophecy beginning in 1798 until the Sunday Law. Hmm. From 1798 to the Sunday Law, the papacy is forgotten, and that's 70 years, okay? You see it? Let's, let's read these four verses and close. And it should come to pass in that day that Tyre shall be forgotten 70 years according to the days of one king, and at the end of the 70 years shall Tyre sing as a harlot. Take a heart, go about the city, thou harlot that has been forgotten. Make sweet melody, sing many songs, that thou mayest be remembered. And it shall come to pass, after the end of seventy years, that the Lord will visit Tyre, and shall, she shall turn to her hire, and shall commit fornication with all the kingdoms of the world upon the face of the earth. And her merchandise and her hire shall be holiness to the Lord. It shall not be treasured nor laid up, for her merchandise shall be for them that dwell before the Lord to eat sufficiently and for durable clothing. We'll come back and look at the ships of Tarshish this afternoon. Shall we pray? <clears throat> Heavenly Father, we thank you for being with us throughout this week. We thank you for this Sabbath, and we know that um, you're wishing to present a message into our hearts and our minds that we can share with others and we can share it convincingly and winningly. We ask that the time we're spending here helps to accomplish that in each of us. But more importantly, we ask that as we eat these, these truths, these, this little book, this honey, that as we consume it, um, that the power that is in your word will work a transformation in each of us, that uh, we might be among those in the near future that are going to glorify you by reflecting your character uh, during the hour of the Sunday Law testing time. Uh, we don't want simply the head knowledge, but we want to settle into the truth intellectually and spiritually. So we ask also that the work that's being accomplished here by you for us would be that twofold work. But we know as Laodiceans that we are the hindrance for that happening. Uh, please awaken us to uh, the different areas in each of our individual experience that need to be set aside, given up, confessed, and repented of, that you might continue in a mighty way um, to raise us up as this ensign in the very near future at the Sunday Law when the one hour begins. In Jesus' name, amen.